Anthropic launching its next generation model. It is called Claude 4. It's a big upgrade. The company, backed by both Amazon and Google, is now valued at more than $60 billion. And yesterday I spoke with Anthropic's chief product officer, uh, Mike Krieger, in his first TV interview since joining the company nearly one year ago. And I asked him how significant the leap in technology is. Claude can now work for you for much longer. It's doing hours of work for you. We're even seeing it in our early access partners that have deployed, you know, Opus 4 in their own use cases, whether it's for coding or other, other hard tasks. And Claude is now doing much, much longer horizon tasks. It's able to manage its own memory. It's able to, you know, work through these hard things autonomously uh, without going off the rails. You say that this defines a new standard in human AI collaboration. What does that mean? When I think about the the relationship you have with AI, you know, at first it was single question, single answer, and then maybe you know earlier this year we were on you know single task that maybe had you know tens of minutes to do it. There's something that shifts when you can start thinking about it not as just a you know an online assistant, but really a virtual collaborator where you're delegating tasks. You might be delegating multiple tasks at once in parallel as well. We've seen our uh, our team start doing that too, where they have different clods running at different tasks in parallel, and all of a sudden you're much more of a of an of an orchestrator or a manager of, of AIs than you are just a you know, user or, or, you know, in a conversation with a single one. Where are we on hallucinations? We used to talk about hallucinations all the time. By the way, we recently I saw uh, there was a headline about a lawyer that was representing Anthropic, as it happened, uh, admitting to an error. I don't know if you saw about the citation that was effectively an hallucination. I think it's important that, uh, especially if you're any in any kind of workflow that involves like citing real sources, and one of the reasons we built what we call the Citations API is that whenever it brings in sources, it actually references that direct source in the actual context that it's showing it in. We're building that into all of our products. So when we have advanced research go off and search, you know, sometimes 500 sources, it did, I had a project yesterday where it searched over 570 sources to answer my question. Um, each of those, when it referenced in the text, has the link back. And that really reduces hallucinations right. because you know that you've grounded every single thing in a real link uh, out on the web or a real document that's in your in your drive or, or within your you know one one drive. So I think that's the the real source of, of reducing hallucinations is telling the model to you know cite sources where needed and then have links back to those sources easily available. Right. How would you today, if you could be totally agnostic about it, how would you stack rank the different large language models? Meaning, where would you put Anthropic and Claude? Where would you put ChatGPT? Uh, Gemini, obviously, Google just had a big announcement around their uh, efforts. Llama, well, how would you, how, how should we think about it? I think they've all sort of taken one particular angle at, at either what they specialize in or what they excel in. For us, the, the thing we keep coming back to is uh, what we call agentic behavior. So be able to act uh, across tools, across different uh, you know, time horizons, be able to work for, for long periods of time. Like that's the real focus that we've had uh, kind of top to bottom as a research team and a product team. And that really differentiates us is where our models excel. It's why our models are good at coding because that's a lot of what you do in coding, but it's also why our models are good uh, at other kind of knowledge work where you're doing work you know, across systems across time. I think that's where uh, I'd put us at the top of the stack, Greg. OpenAI has a, a lot of data around multimodality. So voice in, for example, images, you've seen that uh, uh, be something that they've focused on. And then Google, uh, you know, they've really focused on uh, some of the like lower latency um, and smaller models. And you see that in like 2.5 Flash, which is one of their right. models. So there's there are different points on the curve that I think are all uh, pushing the frontier in different ways. And, and we've really focused on this, this agentic behavior. OpenAI is buying Johnny Ives' uh, AI device startup. I'm just curious what your reaction is uh, to an AI company a startup effectively still in some ways getting into the hardware business now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do hardware wise and, and you know how much of that is building off of what they're already doing with ChatGPT or whether it's uh, some other you know sort of vertical that they that they do. But I think getting the right data into the AI is really, really important. And you know, maybe in a business context that is around all the integrations um, and maybe in, in other parts of your life, it might be having smart glasses so that uh, it, you're looking at something and asking the AI about that thing, whether it's a menu, for example, you're out in the world or somebody that you're, that you're with. And so getting the right uh, data in and out of the AI is one of the key bits. And I think that's where, that's where our hardware play could be interesting. Do you think, for example, when, about, when it comes to hardware, do you think about the relationship with Amazon, and do you ever think like the Alexa Plus is your hardware play? 
it's important to recognize like where you're strong and what partnerships that you have. You know, we're not starting from a place where we ourselves have a hardware arm or have you know millions of devices out there, but we can work with you know a company like Amazon that has probably more home devices out there than anybody else and be an important part of Alexa Plus, for example. And I think that you'll see us like continue to push forward on like both that partnership, but also other ways in which we can, you know be a helpful part of another, you know, hardware play. Then I get startup inbound all the time saying, hey, you know, we're we're shipping a new hardware device. We want cloud to be at the at the forefront of that. Um, and I think that's the way in which we'll show up on hardware. I'm curious on a personal level, this is now, I, I think you're close to uh, maybe just this week. This is it a full year for you at that's Anthropic? Right. Yeah, in so, my, my first anniversary. So tell us about the journey. Uh, you know, you were the co-founder of Instagram. CTO, what, what, what is it like going from that to this, for example? It's somehow, even though I thought being on like one of the fastest growing consumer companies ever in the middle of, you know, the smartphone revolution was moving quick. This is that times a hundred, you know, you can't rest on your laurels. Our last model release was in February and we already had people asking us, you know, oh, it seems like Anthropics hasn't launched a model in a while. I'm like, it's only May. Uh, and so things are, are moving at an unprecedented speed. I've had to reconfigure my own, you know, notion of, you know, how quickly do we need to move? How do we react? Like, what does it mean to remain on the frontier? And at the same time, some things are still constant. Like you still need to build great things and solve problems for people. You're just doing it on an, an even more accelerated timeline. But what I've loved is like the culture and the people here on Topic is just like very aligned with what we were trying to build at Instagram. So it feels like there's continuity there. Another question, just based on this fascinating article um, that talks about, about, about jobs and engineers, folks that you're trying to hire. And this idea that you tell applicants, I don't know if this is right, that you tell applicants uh, to not use AI to help with the with their applications for jobs, why is that? It's interesting that you ask because I'm actually was in a conversation this week around how we're revising our, our interview loop to actually let people use AI <laughs> because that is an actual part of the of, of the software engineering job today, you know, and, and differentiating between you know are you able to use these tools effectively to solve problems. Just like, you know, I talk to people who are like high school teachers and they've had to evolve how they even think about uh, what it means to give assignments out in the age where, you know, people are using AI. Um, I think we're having to evolve even as the company at the forefront of a lot of this technology around how we evaluate um, candidates. So our, our future interview loops will have much more of this uh, ability to co-use AI, but talk about how did you prompt the AI? What were you trying to do with it? What, right. did, what are its limitations? What did you change, you know, based on what it did?